So initially, when this thing popped up on the screen, we saw two basic categories. We saw fuel pressure and fuel condition. Those were the two major things that we had to consider our fuel delivery system. So we have cleanliness, which is a big part of the condition. We don't want to be shoving gravel into our fuel injectors. And we have temperature. Temperature is an important consideration that you might not realize we have some control on. Uh, we see a couple of things here. Back to our Chinese pump. Wait, where is it the genuine thing? I can't tell by looking. There's two different pumps there for a reason. The thing you'll notice about all the welding pumps, except one of the more recent pieces, is that the motor is separate from the pump. The pump is the black square piece on the bottom. The motor is the round piece on top. Here's the nice thing about that. Actually, let me start with bad things about that. These pumps are very loud. <laughs> they don't like them because they're loud. They also don't like them because if they touch that motor, it burns them because they get very hot. And they think, my God, if it did that to my finger, what's it doing to my fuel? Here's the middle real. It's very specifically not doing anything to your fuel because the fuel does not come in contact with the motor. On this pump, the Bosch pump, the motor itself is cooled by the fuel. Or to look at it another way, the fuel is heated by the motor. So this is another embarrassing moment that came as we were developing our flow testing equipment. We had some pretty big pumps there. At one point, we had a uh, Aeromotive A1000 submerged in the fuel cell. And we took it out and ch changed to something else. We also had heaters on the system to maintain appropriate fuel temperatures. And with this big A1000 on the system, we could fire the bench up and within Man, I wish I could remember the specifics. I think within a half an hour, the bench was up to temperature and ready to run. So we had a lot of problems with uh, with that pump because we quite often ran methanol through it, which you're not supposed to do. It wasn't an enormous problem. We ended up going to a weldon because the pump is separated from the motor, and, and that's what essentially was happening. The, F, the methanol was corroding the motor. So what we find is we turn the system on, and now, now our heaters are broken. I'm just sure of it because the bench won't heat up. Well, guess what? That A1000 pump, which passes fuel through the motor, was heating the fuel more than the heaters in the fuel cell were. So we, we had to increase the capacity of our heaters on the system because the pump, that big air motor A1000, was no longer heating up our fuel. The other thing that happened is during summer months, we would occasionally run into problems with maintaining the temperature would get too hot, we were going to have to add chillers to cool it down. The problem disappeared with the welding pump. Now, we can think about it and say, oh, of course. It's because that's not heating the fuel. What shocked me is the difference it made. We're talking about a five-gallon fuel cell, and it would make a night-day difference in the amount of temperature that was put into that fuel. Now, we talked about how cavitation is dependent on two things, temperature and pressure. Well, we could do something about the pressure pressure drop by using smooth fittings going in, large diameter fittings, don't pull the fuel up to all those things. Well, we can do something about temperature too. As much as I like that Bosch L44, that thing can put a lot of heat in your fuel, especially if you're running at high pressures where the current is real high. Because remember, that chart we saw earlier with the Delphi fuel pump that uh, had that point in there that said 23.8% efficiency, it wasn't there randomly, they were bragging. 23.8% efficient. Well, that means that a lot of them are probably a lot worse. Let's just call it 25%. That means 75% of them is heat going into your fuel. So you got a fuel pump. Actually, what you've got is 25% fuel pump, 75% fuel heater. So keep that in mind. And that brings me back to PWM control of fuel pumps. And that's one of the major reasons the manufacturers do it. Hot fuel is bad because it causes cavitation, it makes hot starts hard. All kinds of problems. Uh, I can't. I can't think of a way to stress how important that can be. If you don't have PWM control, using a weld pump or anyone else that separates the two it doesn't have to be welded can pay off big. If you're drag racing, you don't care. I realize that. If you're building a hot shit streetcar and you're going to tune it to make a gazillion horsepower and you're going to give it to the customer and let it drive away, uh, you might want to consider the fact that. Uh, if the fuel's at one temperature on the dyno, but it's on another temperature after he drives it down the freeway for an hour to get to his grandma's house and then boosts it after he leaves the light, you could be in trouble. And the reality is it would be your fault. So heating of the fuel is a big, big, big deal. And I think if any of you were to put temperature sensors into fuel systems, you would be surprised. 
If you were to put a temperature sensor in your fuel system and change from a wetted motor to a dry motor, you would be shocked. Absolutely shocked. So take a look around and, uh, and see what you can find there. It may not be an issue for the type of work you're doing, but if you're having a problem with fuel temperature, PWM control, so you slow it down to a bare minimum, and or a, uh, uh, a dry motor, so that you're not liquid cooling that motor. Now, on the subject of temperature, there's another thing that we need to consider. I said, I used the example of the guy who drives on the freeway for an hour and leaves the light and feels really hot. There are two things that happen with high fuel temperatures. Well, more than that, but cavitation is one. Uh, leaning out of the air fuel ratio is the other. Here's what happens. A fuel injector delivers a set volume of fuel. As fuel gets hot, its viscosity changes very, very little. The volumetric flow through the injector changes hardly at all. But all of you have had to notice, have, have noticed, if you've been able to separate things, that as the fuel gets hot, the mixture gets linear. Here's why. If you take a piece of aluminum and you measure it with your calipers, put the freezer, measure it again, put it out the sun, measure it again, obviously it expands. Everybody knows that. So there's this really cool sounding term called the cubic coefficient of thermal expansion that we can apply to fluids that says, hey, the same thing happens to fluids. If I take, uh, you've seen it uh, on your fuel jugs, put them on the slum and they're trying to, trying to blow up. So what happens is because the fuel injector is delivering the same volume of fuel, but that volume has a lesser density, your fuel ratio changes because their fuel ratio is mass based, not volume based. So there is some good news here. The good news is that the change in air fuel ratio or the change in fuel density is predictable. It's predictable and it can be accounted for. Now, on my particular car, I chose 125 degrees as my zero point because that's where all of our fuel injectors are characterized. As the fuel gets hotter than that, it adds fuel, so the air fuel ratios remain the same. As the fuel gets cooler, it takes fuel away to maintain the correct air fuel ratio. Whether we're running ethanol, methanol, C16, pump gas, this value of 0.1% per degree Celsius holds very, very close. At least well within the tolerances that we typically deal with on a streetcar. I mean, I can say that it's different for ethanol and gasoline because of it, my lambda will change by 0.002%. We can't measure that. Nothing is safe enough for us to do that. But it's not something you have to guess at. You don't have to say, well, the car got hot and it changed this much, so let me change that. And know that you didn't change it the right amount because something else happened. It's easily definable, and uh, you can apply it in any ECU that gives you the option to do that. My vehicles are not for fun as much as they are for gathering data. And what I mean by that is if I sneeze on a fuel injector while I'm testing it on my flow bench, then I gotta go put it in the car and I gotta go sneeze on it and look at the lambda sensor and see if the same thing happened. My vehicles are used for validation. We want to know that everything that we put out there is exactly what we say it is. And this is one thing that would bite me in the ass. If I did not have fuel temperature compensation in my car, my air fuel ratios would move around, none of my calculations would work correctly. Any questions about that? Yeah. You know what? Send me an email. I'll send you a stupid joke. 